So back to the tempest. Um, I left off by referring to a, uh, an essay by Michel de Montaigne uh, of cannibals, of the cannibals, uh, which was translated from the French into English by John Florio in 1603, uh, which essentially, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to attach for you the 11 page uh, PDF here to our, our class syllabus, as I said. He essentially praises the, uh, the, the natives of uh, North America uh, as something along the lines of what we would today call noble savages. And, um, and that estimation in uh, Montaigne's uh, opinion of the, those indigenous to the North Americas uh, is said to inform Shakespeare's play uh, and its portrait. And the, the malign portrait of this is therefore the malignity of Prospero and so forth. I see, so no, I see no reason to come to this conclusion aside from the, the critics already being predisposed to uh, suppress or express their feeling of guilt uh, for the, uh, the settlement of the North Americas. Uh, it's not really in the play. Um, but uh, Beaumontaine does see the state of the uh, North Americas as almost an ideal state, like an Atlantis. And, and here in Montaigne, very early on, the first page, he refers to the story in the Timaeus, which is one of the very few texts that was read throughout the Middle Ages from Plato. In fact, it was the only surviving one because it talked about a demiurge which was seen as a, an analogy for God. God is a sort of creator. Um, uh, this is, leads to sort of heretical conclusions, but this was preserved um, and, and read, and it was very influential in, in medieval thought, by the way. But in the Timaeus, he tells a story about uh, this place, this legendary island called Atlantis. You're wondering where that legend comes from? It actually comes from Plato. Uh, and it, it's situated right outside Gibraltar, so in the Atlantic. And I'll just read Montaigne here. Which contained more countries than both Africa and Asia put together, and that the kings of that country, who had not only possessed that isle, but extend their dominion so far into the continent, that they had a country of Africa as far as Egypt, and extending to Europe, to Tuscany, attempted to encroach upon, even upon Asia and to subjugate all the nations that border upon the Mediterranean Sea as far as the Black Sea, and to the effect that overran all Spain, the Gauls, that is the French, and Italy, at, so far as to penetrate into Greece, where the Athenians stopped them, but that sometime after both the Atlanteans and they and their island were swallowed by the flood. Flood being the universal flood that is mentioned in Genesis. And that's what happened to the island of Atlantis. Plato averse to the fact that it's known throughout the ancient world, globally, that a flood happened. One of the signs that the Bible actually gives us a historical record and not just a mythological story speaking. The universal flood is testified in every culture. Um, but here the island of Atlantis, a sort of uh, empire, uh, Montaigne's essay is brilliant. He's clearly a deeply read man. But his reflection on the, the natives is not that they are cannibals, but rather that they are misunderstood noble savages. A very influential essay. Uh, I, I do see its influence in Shakespeare, uh, but not in the sense that Shakespeare uh, agrees with this viewpoint. Although one of his um, figures speaks of uh, this perspective in his play. So Gonzalo in a speech, and I want you to attend to this, I'm not sure I'm going to get to it today, but in Act 2, Scene 1, lines 148 to 169, he gives a speech about his ideal commonwealth. The ideal commonwealth, and he's an honest old counselor, an ideal commonwealth uh, which would be uh, um, basically not governed the way things are governed right now reflecting the idea that human nature is not fallen, not sinful, not corrupt, 
but is basically naturally good. And that brings one of the themes up for the entire play, which is there, and I, I have not yet mentioned this, uh, the question of nature, which we've already seen in several of Shakespeare's plays touched upon. And it's a complex topic for us post-romantics, because for us, romantics, uh, under the influence of the romantics, nature is seen as good, and not only good as holy, and is a source of renovation. We go back to nature. People who are natural are of superior moral quality to those who are civilized. This reflects the idea of Rousseau's noble savage, and it's a suggestion that corruption in the fall comes about through art, through cultivation, through civilization. But in its natural state, humanity is basically good. Again, the same perspective, more or less, that Montaigne takes in his letter of cannibals. A very influential thing. But the word uh, nature is used in King Lear, where it's a, it's a dominant theme. Regular references to nature. By the way, the word nature is not a scriptural world. The word uh, phusis in Greek, not used in scripture. It's creation. It's not nature. When he creates, he doesn't create nature. That the word just simply is not there. Uh, the word comes from the Stoics, where they talk about phusis, and they talk about a, a, a demiurge type figure again. We've, we've introduced Platonic or, or Greco, Greek ideas into uh, Christian conversations and brought it in through the Romantics, and it confuses the topic. Let me say something about this then. But in the Winter's Tale in Lear, um, and in the Tempest, nature is a, an important concern. And uh, Miranda expresses this when she first sees Ferdinand. Remember, Miranda is a young woman who has never clapped eyes on a man aside from her father and Caliban, who she doesn't consider to be a man. Interesting. It's not a pejorative judgment. It's not because she, it's, it's, he is something different. This is, again, speaking back against the colonialism that most critics are wanting to read in the text now. Caliban is a monster. In his appearance, he's not a man. But he's the only thing around, in a sense, that is man-like in some sense. But when she sees Ferdinand, Miranda says this, nothing natural I ever saw so noble. First look at Ferdinand. Now, what, now what does this word, word natural mean? In many means in Shakespeare's English, many meanings. And again, if you want a, a study of the word nature, go to C.S. Lewis's studies in words, and he will talk to you about how it's used in the, in the ancient world, uh, among others, the Stoics, gets picked up in the medieval period and the Renaissance period, and eventually becomes what we now think of as the uh, only word, only connotations of nature, which are those bequeathed by the Romantics. As I say, this primally good entity related to the earth, which has divine qualities. That's not what Shakespeare means by nature. What does Shakespeare mean by nature? Well, let's say a complex question. In The Tempest, natural and supernatural are in some sense connected, but not in the sense of magic. Prospero uses his art, and I already talked about his art. We might as well use the word science because the seven liberal arts, as they were understood in the day, will encompass the world of number, as well as words, the words of the trivium, grammar, uh, logic, rhetoric, but also mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and music. And note the importance of music in, <coughs> in this play, but this is one of the arts but it's seen through number, and number is what we associate with the realm of science. And in the ancient world and in the university life of Shakespeare's day, the liberal arts were included what we call the sciences. They were seen as the same realm dealing with slightly different things. So when Shakespeare uses his art, he's, we may as well say he uses his science, but it's a science that fits the order of what we will call nature. <laughs> and it's how he moves from one realm to the other, from the natural to the supernatural. Uh, and in the medieval and Renaissance uh, conception, nature is uh, what we call nature in relation to human beings is better used 
uh, to describe the word, uh, the, the word kind is used. So note that in Genesis, and the, gen in the so, so let's say the authorized version, King, King James Version, things are separated according to the animals and things according to their kind, and we call humankind. That's what we mean by a nature, is a kind. So things have a different nature. They don't use the word nature. They use a kind. And so when you, when you ask somebody to be kind, <coughs> you're not asking them to be polite or gentle. You're asking them to act in accordance with human nature. Be like a human being, which is you're calling upon them to be like the fullest expression of humanity, who is Christ. You tell a child to be kind. You're not just saying don't be cruel and brutal. You're, a, you're actually calling on the child to act Christ-like towards the animal. Because he is the foremost expression of the kind, which is humankind. <coughs> be like the second Adam. Be kind in accordance with your kind. Animals, according to their kind, are not kind like we are because they're of a different kind. Remember when, when Hamlet is speaking uh, to Claudius, he says, a little more than kin and less than kind. He's talking about the moral failure, the lack of Christ-likeness in Claudius in that remark. So play on this, kind, and kind has strong Christian connotation. It's here, and the audience picks that up. We, it just goes right over our heads. We say kind, nature, it's sort of the same. Are there, there are synonyms, right? No, they're not synonyms. So uh, when the Renaissance is trying to think about what we call human nature, it will use the word kind, and they will see human nature as notoriously capable of the most noble acts and also the most despicable to behavior. That's the nature of humankind. Unlike the animals who are not capable of noble behavior or despicable behavior. And it's the, it is the responsibility of mankind to domesticate the animals, to, to make them, to subdue them and bring them under dominion and to treat them kindly in accordance with your kind as a Christian. Under God's rule and reign, you will treat the animals kindly as, a, as Christ would. You will rule over them because you're called upon to do that. You're told to exercise dominion over the earth, but that doesn't mean a, a strict authority as if this didn't have any relation to God. Remember, these creatures have been created by God according to their kinds. And they're under the rule of Adam, who's expression of mankind, and mankind bears God's image. And one day, Christ will not be made in the image of God. We will be told he is the image of God. He is, not in, but is the image of God. So if you want to see what humankind is supposed to be like, we need to read Christ in all of these words. The use of the word kind with respect to people always has connotations of Christ and the way Christ is to inform human thinking. That's in the Elizabethan audience's mind. It's not in our minds. It's certainly not in the contemporary uh, discussions of this that I'm reading about from the critics. They're just, it just goes right over their heads. Not even a part of the discussion. But it's the action of a brother in deposing a prince, which is the context of the play. Remember, uh, Prospero has been deposed by his brother Antonio, usurped his reign. Is this kind of him to do this? No, it's not kind. It's not Christ-like. It's, a, it's, it's not quite Cain and Abel either. He didn't kill his brother. On the other hand, he sent him into exile, which in the civilized world is also a barbaric act. He's condemning him to a sort of death. He's sending him off with his little baby daughter, with an infant, in a boat. Out of mercy, He's given his books, which are the means by which he recovers his throne, the culture that he brings with him. It's not the na natural features of the island that allow him to survive. It's his books, it's his art, it's his engagement, the 
foregoing engagement with the world that God created over generations passed on through books which he learns that are going to be the means by which he recovers his throne and his place in it, but also will educate him how he is to act and among other things will lead him to, uh, as I say, break his staff and drown his books. So he will act like a man going forward. He will no longer be stuck in his ivory tower, but will act as the prince or Duke of Milan as he began, the proper Duke of Milan, as he's described here right in the outset here. Note that Caliban in the Dramatis Persona is called a savage and deformed slave. He's deformed. Is he even human at all? We're not entirely sure. But is that a natural act? No, it's not. It's an unkind act. It's not, he's going against justice. He's going against God's authoritative rule over the princes of the earth. It's not on par with what Macbeth does, but it's in the same, it's in the same direction. He's overthrown lawful rule out of selfish ambition. Question, is it natural to serve only your own interests and care about nothing for those of others? Is Caliban a natural man with no innate moral concerns or ability to comprehend the interests or needs of others? Because he doesn't seem to have them. Does that make him closer to nature? Is that how Shakespeare portrays him? Are we supposed to think he's a noble savage? Modern critics, as I say, tend to portray Caliban because he's, he speaks in, in verse as a noble savage. But how did he come to learn to speak verse? Prospero taught him. He tried to ennoble him. He tried to make him better. He used the man or creature or whatever he has confronted here, whatever monster it is, it's hu human-like in some ways, and tried to perfect it. He's using grace through his art to perfect nature, and he's failed in it. He has taught him to speak verse, and yet Caliban would have raped his daughter, tried to, in fact, if he had not been stopped. He, was in, he failed in his attempt to reform Caliban, for which reason he's treated now as a slave and basely, he's treating him very cruelly. Is he treating him unkindly is the question. Is it unkind to treat reprobates who are a danger to your family in this fashion? Is it unkind? Well, if he were a human, it might be, but it might not be as well. He didn't kill him. For it. If he'd succeeded in the rape, he may have done so, by the way, because that, the uh, biblical punishment for rape is actually mur is, 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 uh, execution. It's a capital offense. He failed in this, but he would have, and even says, and I would have succeeded had you not intervened. And he would still do it. Caliban's quite clear on this. So is Caliban the noble savage, which contemporary critics want to see him as? I'd, I happen to think not. And he's not a natural man either. He is an unkind, perhaps a different kind of individual altogether, but Prospero is entirely kind in treating those who are hostile to grace <coughs> with something less than grace. They won't accept grace. He does not want good. I've done my best with this character. He does want freedom, which again, everyone after the Enlightenment wants freedom, but what would he use his freedom for? It seems simply self-indulgence. He wants to be king as well. He wants to rule over the others and satisfy his base appetites, just like the common men that he will confront as well. They're, they're happy to, oh, we're in a place where there's no, uh, where the aristocrats don't rule, where basically we're left to our own natural devices. Well, I'm just as strong as this fellow and physical strength counts for a great deal in difficult conditions, let's talk about politics. See who's gonna rule here. And they're happy to talk about Caliban in, as a potential ruler for manipulative reasons. The problem with Caliban is that he's beyond the lower limits of human nature. He's not even a commoner. There's something about him that is not human. I think that's the clear portrait in Shakespeare's plays. 
And I do not see this as a reflection on Shakespeare's view of North America or the peoples of North America that are confronted. I don't see it. <clears throat> it's a possible reading, but I think given the context of what's said in the play, there's just because you find documents in the same age that have some correspondences doesn't mean that he's taking a side in that. It's just he's aware of it. He uses a little bit of it, but is he really talking about colonialism and the right of the Westerners? And those are cannibals and they're savages and we can treat them however we want. He doesn't present ca Caliban as a cannibal even. As I say, it's an anagram of the word. It's, he's, he's engaging with it, but he sees them as a, a subhuman figure. <clears throat> but he can't be morally regenerated. Uh, and Caliban says this in Act 5, uh, Scene 1. What a thrice double ass was I to take this drunkard for a god and worship this dull fool. So Caliban, for his part, took Prospero to be a god. That does not, and, and of course, it's also the case that people from the Western world, when they went to lands, North America, Africa, other places, were received as gods because they had art, that is science, which gave them technology that was far beyond the capacity of those that they confronted, and were inclined because of the idolatrous human heart to worship those with those powers. That did not mean that they correspondingly saw themselves as gods and them as beneath their human dignity. There's a di big discussion in the period. It's not confined to uh, or limited to the discussion of Montaigne either uh, by, among others, uh, popes of the day. They will talk about those that are in those lands being human beings and need to be treated as such. It's very clear declarations. There's all sorts of ambiguities in the treatment of natives. I don't need to get into that because this is about the play. The play is not authorizing colonialism or seeing a reflection on that in any way. As far as I'm concerned, I just don't see it. Other than superficial resemblances from documents of the period, that is the, uh, the materialist quasi-Marxist perspective that has so infected Shakespeare studies and most of English literature now. Let me come to Act 5 scene, or the, 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 the beginning of the play. Gosh, we can even get to it. There we go. It's on page what here? 144, that's all the critical apparatus in this here. It's extraordinary. Can you actually see this? Surely you can. <clears throat> Act, and, and note that the scene, do we have the scene here? Yes, there it is. No, I don't even think it's on there. Or is it at the bottom of this page? No, it's not. So the scene is not there, but it is in my, oh, it's in the dramatis personae, that's why. But is it there in this? No, it's not. Okay, that's funny. Oh no, there it is. The scene, an uninhabited island. That's in my text. Among the dramatis personae. So it's, it's something very unusual in Shakespeare. Even in the Dramatis Personae, it gives us a scene. And the scene is an uninhabited island and in brackets, a ship at sea. Those, are the, that, those two, two places in one scene. Now, how is it possible to have two places in one scene? Because we're being asked to think about two places simultaneously. Very easy to do in filmmaking. Very difficult to do on stage because you only have one stage. So you'd want to see them as separate places. I don't know how you would suggest that they're separate in location, but they're happening concurrently is, is the point here. But the scene is a, and the scene having been set as two places, a tempestuous noise of thunder and lightning heard enter a sh shipmaster and a boatswain. Boatswain, here master, what cheer? Good, speak to the mariners, fall to it, yarrowly, or we run ourselves aground. Bestir, bestir, out he goes. The mariners come in. Hi, my hearts, cheerly, 
Cheerily, my hearts, yar, yar, take in the topsail, tend to the master's whistle, blow till thou burst thy wind, if room enough. Enter Alonso, Sebastian, Antonio, Ferdinando, Gonzalo, and others. All of these are, are people from uh, the current rulers of uh, Milan, as well as Naples, just happened to be on the boat. And it turns out that it is the orchestration of none other than Prospero that got them on this boat, just like he was put on the boat through his art. Now, don't ask me how this worked. And through his science, he's managed to see and get these men to be on this boat. Again, you're to suspend your disbelief that art is capable of this, or science is capable, not only of uh, predicting what's going to happen, but to actually orchestrate that they end up on the ship. It's an art beyond our art, but it nonetheless is seen as an extension of art, which does push in the direction of magic, admittedly. <clears throat> At any rate, good ba boatswain, have care, where's the master? Play the men. I pray now keep below. Where is the master, boatswain? Do you not hear him? You mar our labor. Keep your cabins. You do assist the storm in creating chaos. Uh, nay, good. Be patient when, when the sea is. So here we have aristocrats coming up on deck, trying to give orders to the sailors. The sailors are in their element. The aristocrats want to boss things because they're used to being in rule, and actually they're just getting in the way. They're impediments, they're not in charge here. Okay, when the, ship, when, the, when the seas calm, then we will do what you're saying. Until then, you go down below and get out of our way. So there's, there's a revolt and chaos on the ship, mirroring the chaos that's happening outside the ship in the tempest. <laughs> Hence, when the sea is, I'll be patient. Hence, what cares these roarers for the name of king? To cabin, silence, trouble us not. Good. Yet remember whom thou hast aboard, Boatswain. None, more, none that I more love than myself. You are a counselor. If you can command these elements to silence and work the peace of the present, we will not hand a rope more. Use your authority. If you cannot, give thanks you have lived so long and make yourself ready in your cabin for the mischance of the hour, if it so hap. Cheerly, good hearts. Out of our way, I say. I have great comfort from this fellow. Methinks he hath, hath no drowning mark upon him. His complexion is perfect gallows. <laughs> yeah. In this, yeah, he's not going to die from drowning when he's, this is all over. I'm going to hang him for insubordination. Stand fast, good fate, to his hanging. Make the rope of his destiny our cable, for our own doth little advantage. If he be not born to be hanged, our case is miserable. Enter Boatswain. So the cheekiness of the Boatswain back to Gonzalo, a little bit of the friction between the nobility and the commoners here in the situation where the nobility really have no authority and ought not to get involved and not, ought not to interfere is part of the comedy of the play at the outset. So that just suggesting things that are going to become more apparent once they actually crash uh, and uh, are saved by Prospero's art. Enter boatswain. Down with the topmast. Yar, lower, lower. Bring her to pro try with main course. A cry within. A plague upon this howling. They are louder than the weather or our office. Yet again, the nobility come back on top, on, on the deck. Yet again, what do you hear? Shall we give o'er and drown? Have you a mind to sink? A pox on your throat, you bawling, blasphemous, incharitable dog. Work you then. Hang, cur. Hang, you horse and insolent noisemaker. We are less afraid to be drowned than thou art. I'll warrant him for drowning, though the ship were no stronger than a nutshell and as leaky as an unstanched wench. Lay her a hold, a hold, set her two courses off to sea again. Lay her off. 
enter mariners what? All lost. To prayers, to prayers, all lost. What? Must our mouths be cold? The king and prince at prayers. Let's assist them, for our case is as theirs. I'm out of patience. We are merely cheated of our lives by drunkards. This wide-chopped rascal, the one who's talking back to him, the aristocrat, would thou mightst lie drowning the washing of ten tides. He'll be hanged yet, though every drop of water swear against it and gape at widest to glut him. A confused noise within. Mercy on us, we split, we split. Farewell, my wife and children. Farewell, brother. We split, we split. Let's all sink with the king. Let's take leave of him. And they all go with Antonio. Gonzalo. Now would I give a thousand furlongs of sea for an acre of barren ground. Long heath, brown furs, anything. The wills above be done, but I would fain die a dry death. So they think that they are done. But on the ship, we already see discord that mirrors that of the tempest. Remember, the tempest is a sign of discord and chaos. And again, think about the creation narrative. God subdues. He, he uh, subdues the earth, separates things, and he fills it. He creates order and peace and calm. Sin causes discord to happen again. Things fall apart, they go back to the word. The flood happens when things that are separated, the, the waters from above and the waters from below, start collapsing in, going back to their original state. They come back in. He had separated them, now they go back. Same thing is happening, but it's a reflection not only of a natural phenomenon, it's a reflection of chaos returning. Chaos is here seen mirrored in a sort of a microcosm on the ship's deck of the macrocosm of the tempest outside them. The, the, the nobles want to boss and order the situation. The commoners say, your rule doesn't have any effect here whatsoever and I'm not going to hear you. And he says, I'm going to, I'm going to hang this guy if we ever survive. And they end it with, they're not going to survive. Scene two, same time frame, Prospero and Miranda. If by your art, my dearest father, you have put the wild waters in this roar, allay them. The sky, it seems, would pour down stinking pitch. Stinking pitch, just like in Sodom and Gomorrah. Pitch the, like the, of judgment. But that the sea mounting over the welkin's cheek, the cloud's cheek, dashes the fire out. Oh, I have suffered with those that I saw suffer. A brave vessel who had, no doubt, some noble creatures in her, dashed all to pieces. Oh, the cry did knock against my very heart. Poor souls, they perished. Had I been any god of power, I would have sunk the sea within the earth, or ere it should the good ship so have swallowed, and the frotting souls within her. So Miranda does not see anything other than a sign of desolation and she pities and said if she had the power she would have not brought it about so prospero who has orchestrated the whole thing and knows the outcome differently says be collected no more amazement tell your piteous heart there's no harm done oh woe the day no harm i have done nothing but in care of thee, of thee, my dear one, thee, my daughter, who art ignorant of what thou art, not knowing of whence I am, nor that I am more better than Prospero, master of a full, poor cell, and thy no greater father. She knows him simply as a prison mate. They're imprisoned here on the island. This is like a prison. And he, yes, she knows he's her, her father, but she doesn't know what he was before he came here. She, no idea of politics, no idea of any world outside of the natural confines of this island. <clears throat> More to know did never meddle with my thoughts. Tis time, tis time I should inform thee further. 
lend thy hand. Lend thy hand and pluck my magic garment from me. So, lie there my art. So he puts on the robes. Now, let me just say one comment on the robes. In terms of um, life in the Western world, there are certain people who wear robes. And, it's, it, and, it's, and to put it very quickly, it's the Levitical professions. Judges wear robes, politicians wear robes, lawyers wear robes, academics wear robes. <clears throat> I don't wear the robes of an academic. I would have in Britain. You have robes. We do it when we process here, but that's it. But in teaching in general, you put on robes. Uh, priests wear robes, vestments. What, and the, the vestments of the priestly order, the Levites, are certain professions. And, the prof and, and even policemen will wear robes, actually, because it's part of the Levitical. And doctors will wear, wear robes. These are all Levitical professions, and they come about through the art or the science uh, that cultivates human nature and the robes reflect that learning and accomplishment when he has a magic garment on him it is a magic garment of course but it's an intensification of the liberal arts that Shakespeare and his audience would have understood in general so it's not just strictly speaking a magic garment let's not think about the relation to art or the liberal arts or academic learning and so forth it's an extension of that it's a very high representation of that but it nonetheless is a robe that he wears and I still think to this day that the academy in some sense rightly understood is like all the Levitical professions uh, charged with following God's law and executing his reign on earth. That's how we exercise just dominion. There's nothing wrong with the robes. They ought to be used in the way that Prospero uses them. But back to this, lend my hand and pluck my magic garment from me. So lie there my art. Wipe thou thine eyes, have comfort. The direful spectacle of the wreck which touched the very virtue of compassion in thee. I have with such provision in mine art, so safely ordered that there is no soul, no, not so much perdition as an hair, betid to any creature in the vessel which thou heardst cry, which thou sawst sink. Sit down, for thou must know further. So he has saved everybody on the boat. You saw the ship destroyed. However, I saved everybody inside of it. Now sit down. You have often begun to tell me what I am, but stopped and left me to a bootless inquisition, concluding, stay, not yet. The hours now come. The very minute bids thee ope thine ear. Obey and be attentive. Now, this is a young woman. It's a father speaking to an adolescent daughter, and in response to the pay attention, what does she do? She, or, <laughs> she starts looking around, is distracted, and doesn't pay attention. So that's, there's going to be comedy in the scene again. There was comedy in the first scene, there's comedy in this scene. Not a lot of tragedy, or a potential tragedy a little bit in the play, but this is a very humorous play. The relation between Prosper and Miranda is a very light one, just like amongst the uh, all of the inhabitants here. There is tragedy, but it never really goes so far as to be a, a, a great possible tragedy. That we'll, we'll see that there is some in Act 3. Possibility there, but it never goes so far as to really think that anyone other than Prospero is in control of the scene. <laughs> anyway, the very men op op thy ear, obey and be attentive. Canst thou remember a time before we came unto this cell? I do not think thou canst. For thou then what? For then thou wast not out three years old. Certainly, sir, I can. By what? By what? Uh, by, by any other house or person? Of anything the image? Tell me, that hath kept with thy remembrance. Tis far off, and rather like a dream than an assurance that my remembrance warrants. Had I not four or five women once that tended me? Thou hadst, and more, Miranda. By the way, the word Miranda, the name Miranda, means to be admired. It's a gerund in Latin. It, the word Miranda is to be admired. Here's Miranda's plight. She is on an island where, there, where she cannot be admired. She's meant to be looked upon. Remember how Adam, when Adam saw Eve and 
pursued her, he loved her, he fell in wonderment at her, he thought that she was wonderful. In, Ad in Milton's rendition, which comes after this, he pursues her and she runs <laughs> away from him. Um, but she's to be admired. She's not admired here. She's in a place where she cannot become who she is. Prospero cannot stay on the island as a good father and allow his daughter, who ought to be admired, to be unadmired by anybody but save him. She needs a, somebody who will carry on his legacy. That will be another man, another human man. Caliban it cannot be. Caliban is unfit. He will be cursed if, Pal if Caliban uh, marries his daughter. Not possible. It's not just that he's, he's a would-be rapist. He has bad character. I must get off this island for my daughter's sake. <clears throat> uh, what seest thou else in the dark backward and abysm of time? If thou rememberst aught, ere thou camest here, how thou camest here thou mayest. But that I do not. Twelve years since Miranda, so she's 15, she left when she's three. It's been 12 years. It's a 15-year-old girl. 12 years since, thy father was the Duke of Milan and a prince of power. Sir, are, are, not, are you not my father? <laughs> <laughs> thy mother was a piece of virtue, and she said thou wast my daughter. And thy father was Duke of Milan, and his only heir and princess no worse issued. So a very light, humorous exchange. Oh, the heavens, what foul play had we that we came from thence? Or blessed was we did? Both, both, my girl, by foul play, as thou sayest, were we heaved thence, but blessedly hope hither. How are they blessedly hope hither? Who brought them here? God. It wasn't his art. They were blessedly hope hither, helped. Oh, my heart bleeds to think, O oh, the teen, that I have turned you to, which is from the, my remembrance, please you, farther. He, she thought he was just his father. She didn't realize she was dealing with a, a man of position and importance in the world. He's just dad. And he's a, he's a bossy dad, and he's not a fit companion for her. She's a... 15 year old girl and he's grumpy a little bit and he doesn't understand he doesn't confide in her they're not fit we have an adam and eve here but there there's no pairing is not going to happen so there's problems here in that there's chaos in that relationship it can't flourish on the island it's, it's a problem to be solved and he has to solve the problem pray you farther my brother and thy uncle called antonio I pray thee, mark me, because she's already looking around and not paying attention. I pray thee, mark thee, that a brother should be so perfidious. He whom next myself of all the world I loved, of all the world I loved, and to him put the manage of my state, as at that time through all these signories it was the first, and Prospero, the prime duke, being so reputed in dignity and for the liberal arts without a parallel. Those being all my study, the government I cast upon my brother, and to my state grew stranger, being transported and wrapped in secret studies. Thy false uncle, dost thou attend me? Because she's already losing concentration, thinking about, you know, a butterfly's gone by or so, who knows. Dosso temi, sir, most heedfully, being once perfected how to grant suits, how to deny them, who to advance, and who to trash for o'ertopping, new created the creatures that were mine, I say, or changed them, or else new formed them, having both the key of officer and office set all their hearts in the state to what tune pleased his ear that now he was the ivy which had hid my princely trunk and sucked my verger out on Thou attends not. Go, oh, good sir, I do. Comic interaction. But note the, 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 the language here. He, he delegates his authority to his brother in the same way that God delegates to him his authority. He trusts his brother. His brother 
likes this but wants more power out of it. And as a result, he starts appointing people or turning people who are his father's or his brother's appointees towards him so that he's the lawful king. And they eventually forget that he's the one who is the, the actual Duke of Milan. And in concert, then they will rebel against him. Oh, sir, I, I, I do. I pray thee, mark me. I, thus neglecting worldly ends, all dedicated to closeness and the bettering of my mind, with that which, but by being so retired or prized all popular rate, in thy false, in my false brother awaked an evil nature, and my trust, like a good parent, did beget of him a falsehood in its contrary, as great as my trust was, which had indeed no limit, a confidence sans bound. He, being thus lorded, not only with what my revenue yielded, but what my power might else exact, like one who, having into truth by telling of it, made such a sinner of his memory to credit his own lie, he did believe he was indeed the duke, out of the substitution, and executing the outward face of royalty with all prerogative. Hence his ambition growing. Dost thou hear? She keeps getting distracted, losing focus, whatever. Prince Caspian shows the same interplay, by the way. The, it's an echo of this, the two brothers and the one usurps the other, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually he thinks that he's the rightful heir because the other one's caught up in his study and his arts and so forth. As I say, Prince Caspian is directly taken from this scene. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> Dost thou hear? Your tale, sir, would cure deafness. <laughs> Dost thou hear? Because he's shouting at her now. <laughs> to have no screen between this part he played and him he played it for. For needs will be absolute Milan. Me, poor man, my library was dukedom enough. Of temporal royalties, he thinks now me now incapable, confederates, so dry he was for sway, with the king of Naples to give him annual tribute, do him homage, subject his coronet to his crown, and bend the dukedom yet unbowed, alas, poor Milan, to most ignoble stooping. Oh, the heavens! Mark his condition and the event. Then tell me if this might be a brother. I should sin to think but nobly of my grandmother, good wombs have borne bad sons. Now the condition. This, now the condition as in now the current condition. Now this king of Naples, or how we got into this state of affairs. Now the condition. This king of Naples being an enemy to me inveterate, hearkens my brother's suit, which was that he in lieu of the promises, premises of homage, and I know not how much tribute, should presently extirpate me and mine out of the dukedom and confer fair Milan with all the honors on my brother. Whereon a treacherous army levied, one midnight fated to the purpose, did Antonio open the gates of Milan, and in the dead of darkness, the ministers for the purpose hurried thence, me and thy crying self. Alack, for pity, I not remembering how I cried out then, will cry it o'er again. It is a hint that rings mine eyes to it. Here a little further. Here a little further. And then I'll bring thee to the present business, which now is upon us, without the which this story were most impertinent. Wherefore did they not that hour destroy us? Good question. Why didn't they just kill us? Well demanded, wench. Wench is just a woman. Don't get the pejorative connotations that we associate with that. Well demanded, wench. My tale provokes that question. Dear, they durst not. So dear the love my people bore me, nor set a mark so bloody on the business, but with colors fairer painted their foul ends. In few, they hurried us aboard a bark, bore some leagues to sea, where they prepared a rotten carcass of a butt, not rigged, 
nor tackle, sail, nor mast. The very rats instinctively have quit it. There they hoist us to cry to the sea that roared to us to sigh to the winds whose pity sighing back again did us but lovingly wrong. Alack, what trouble was I then to you? Oh, a cherubim was that thou wast that did preserve me. Thou didst smile. Infused with a fortitude from heaven. When I have decked the sea with drops full salt, under my burthen groaned, uh, which raised in me an undergoing stomach to bear up against that should ensue. He was despairing. He was sad about what happened, but at the smile of his little daughter gave him strength to carry on. It's very touching. How came we ashore? By providence divine. By providence divine. Some food we had and some fresh water that a noble Neapolitan, Gonzalo, out of his charity, who being then appointed master of this design, did give us, with rich garments, linens, stuffs, and necessaries, which since I have studied much, so of his gentleness, knowing I loved my books, he furnished me from mine own library with volumes that I prize above my dukedom. Would I might ever see but see that man. Now I arise. Puts back on the robe. We took off the robe when he was the father. Puts on the robe when he is executing a particular office. The office of being a vice regent of gods to orchestrate things. Note that he doesn't think he's God. Divine providence brought us here. But these means are means by which I will recover that which was lost but also rectify the wrongs doing. Now he's blamed his brother for the actions, but to some degree there's, a, there's an implicit recognition of his own guilt in this because he bestowed these offices on his brother, which were actually his to execute. So there's a, there's a, a, a slight hint, although he doesn't take it very far of reproach here, for what he allowed to happen. Now I arise, puts on his robe, sits still and hear the last of our sea sorrow. Here in this island we arrived, and here have I thy schoolmaster, thy pedagogue, just like in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 10, thereabouts, it's instructed her in things, in the law of the Lord, the loving things, applied this everywhere, through art to the world around her, has taught her to think, uh, also in obedience of Ephesians 6 verse 4 thy school must made thee more profit than other princes can that have more time for vainer hours and tutors not so careful he was allowed to homeschool her he devoted all his wisdom and all his attention not to his studies but to the cultivation of his daughter he saw that, and so the benefit to her has been far greater than if they'd stayed back where they were. Heavens, thank you for it. And now I pray you, sir, for still tis beating in my mind, your reason for raising this sea storm, no thus far forth. By accident, most strange, bountiful fortune, now, my dear lady, hath mine enemies brought to this shore, and by my prescience... I find my zenith doth depend on, on a most auspicious star. So how did he know? Through astronomy. A star was seen, a constellation that betokened that God, by God's grace, things have come about. A sign has been given from heaven, which he saw that things were going to happen for his providential designs to bring him off this island again. A most auspicious star whose influence if now I court not, but omit, my fortunes will ever after droop. So God ordained the circumstances. I saw them in my study of astronomy, and now I need to take my chance, or it's, it's past and it's gone forever. Here, cease more questions. Thou art inclined to sleep, tis a good dullness. And give it away. I know thou canst not choose. And then to Ariel. Come away, servant, come. I am ready now. Approach my Ariel, come. Now Ariel enters. All hail great master. And again, Ariel, don't think of the little 
Don't think of Disney. Not a female character, it's a male spirit. Masculine spirit, never mind male, masculine spirit. Should not be portrayed as it is in Eric Gill's uh, portrait, but anyway. All hail, great master, grave sir. Hail, I come to answer my, thy best pleasure. Be to fly, to swim, to dive into the, to the fire, to ride on the curled clouds. To thy strong bidding, task Ariel and all his quality. Hast thou, spirit, ref performed to point the tempest that I bade thee to every article? I boarded the king's ship, now on the beak, now in the waist. The deck in every cabin I flamed amazement. Sometime I divide and burn in many places, on the topmast, the yards, and bowsprit, would I flame distinctly, <coughs> then meet and join. Jove's lightning, the precursors of the dreadful thunderclaps, more momentary in sight outrunning were not. The fire and cracks of sulphurous roaring, the most mighty Neptune seemed to besiege and make his bold waves tremble, yea, his dread trident shake. My brave spirit, who was so firm, so constant, that this coil would not infect his reason? <coughs> not a soul, but felt a fever of the mad and played some tricks of desperation. All but mariners plunged in the foaming brine and quit the vessel. Then all afire with me, the king's son, Ferdinand, with hair upstaring, then like reeds, not hair, was the first man that leapt, cried, hell is empty and all the devils are here. So Ariel terrifies them so that they actually leap off the ship. In terror. So it wasn't just the, the tempest. It was there was a spiritual present Ariel that was like fire all around them and they jumped in their fit of terror and madness into the sea to get away from the shipwreck. Why, that's my spirit, but was not this nigh, nigh shore, close by my master? And are they, Ariel, safe? Not a hair perished. On their sustaining garments, not a blemish, but fresher than before. And as thou badest me, in troops I have dispersed them about the isle. The king's son have I landed by myself, whom I left cooling of the air with sighs in an odd angle of the aisle, and sitting, his arms in this sad knot, arms wrapped around his knees. Of the king's ship, the mariners, say how they ha thou hast disposed, and all the rest of the fleet. Safely in harbor is the king's ship. So he didn't destroy the ship. They thought the ship was going to get wrecked. They jumped out because they fire in flames, and that ship, he's then led to a harbor around the other side of the island. In the deep nook where once thou callest me up at midnight to fetch dew from the still vexed Bermudas, there she's hid. The Bermudas, where are the Bermudas? The Bermudas are the islands where the Englishmen were stranded for a whole year with good food and water. That's where she got the water. In other words, they're not in the Bermudas, they're not in the Atlantic, they're not over there. He, she's gone all the way, she. He has gone all the way to the Bermudas to get water that long distance and brought them back here to the Mediterranean. Again, evidence. Where there she's hid, the mariners all under hatches stowed, who with a charm joined to their suffered labor, I have left asleep. And for the rest of the fleet, which I dispersed, they all have met again and are upon the Mediterranean float, bound sadly home for Naples, supposing that they saw the king's ship wrecked and his great person cherish or perish. So there are other boats in the, in the fleet and they've gone back thinking that one's gone. So now we just have one boat there. I've saved the boat. It's in a harbor around here. They don't even know that it's there. So the nobles have been separated from the commoners and we're all ready to do what you want to happen. Now, Ariel, thy charge exactly is performed, but there's more work. What is the time of the day? Past the mid season at least two glasses, at least two o'clock. The time twixt six and now must by us both be spent most preciously. The whole uh, action is gonna take place within hours, by the way, of the whole play. 
unity of thought, purpose, and action of characters, it's all going to happen extraordinarily quickly in a very brief space of time. Part of the magic of the island is that these things happen with extraordinary speed and within a short span of time. Is there more toil? Since thou hast given me pains, let me remember thee what thou hast promised, which is not yet performed me. How now, Moody, was, what is thou canst demand? My liberty. Before the time be out, no more. I prithee, remember I have done thee worthy service, told thee no lies, made thee no mistakings, served without grudge or grumblings. Thou didst promise to bait me a full year. Dost thou forget from what a torment I did free thee? No. Ariel is not a, an angel. Is angel. Ariel is a spirit that serves Prospero. Prospero is a benign ruler, but the spirit serves him is not an angel. Do not think of Ariel as an angel. The angel is a, Ariel is a spirit of some sort. He wants freedom, but the freedom is to do what he wants. It's not to do the service of God. Don't think it's like Uriel in Milton's Paradise Lost. Don't confuse the two. Dost thou forget from what a torment? No, thou dost, and thinks it much to tread the ooze of the salt deep, to run upon the sharp wind of the north, and to do me business in the veins of the earth when it is baked with frost. I do not, sir. Thou liest, malignant thing. Hast thou forgot the foul witch Sycorax, who with age and envy was grown into a hoop? Hast thou forgot her? No, sir, thou hast. Where was she born? Speak, tell me. Sir, in Algiers. Where's Algiers? In Algeria, North Africa. Where's the setting of the play? In the Mediterranean, Italy, Algeria, right? Somewhere in there. It's not in the Atlantic beyond that. It's anyway, he gives us geographical things. It's not a comment on that. Even the, even the, I mean, we don't usually get that in Shakespeare's play. It's a magical island. There is no magical island in the West Mediterranean where nobody is. It's just made up. Doesn't matter. It's not reflecting on the cannibals that Montaigne is talking about. Sir in Algiers, oh, was she so? I must once in a month recount what thou hast been which thou forgetst, this damned witch Sycorax, for mischiefs manifold and sorceries terrible to enter human hearing from Algiers, thou knowest, was banished. For one thing she did, they would not take her life. Is not this true? I, sir, this blue-eyed hag. Ah, Sycorax also had blue eyes. Do the natives of North America have blue eyes? No. This blue-eyed hag, was hither brought with child, and here was left by the sailors. Thou, my slave, as thou reports thyself, was then her servant, and, for thou wast a spirit too delicate to act her earthly and abhorred commands, refusing her grand hests, she did confine thee, because she was evil and you didn't want to do all her evil bidding. That's how bad she was. You wouldn't do her, even though she had control over you. And she did confine thee for this by help of her more potent ministers and in her most unmitigable rage into a cloven pine within which rift in prison thou didst painfully remain a dozen years, within which space she died and left thee there, where thou didst vent thy groans as fast as mill wheels strike. Then was this island, save for the sun that she did litter there, here, a freckled whelp, hag-born, reference to Caliban, not honored with a human shape. Yes, Caliban, her son. He doesn't even have a human shape. Is this a human being? Is it a reflection on the people of North America? No, it doesn't even have a human shape. <clears throat> yes, Caliban, her son. Dull thing, I say. I say so. He, that Caliban, whom now I keep in service, thou best knowest what torment I did find thee in. Thy groans did, did make wolves howl and penetrate the breasts of ever angry bears. It was a torment to lay upon the damned, which Sycorax could not again undo. It was mine art when I arrived and heard thee that made gape the pine and let thee out. I thank thee, master. If thou more murmurst, I will rend an oak 
and peg thee in his naughty entrails till thou hast howled away 12 winters. 12, I'll put you back and I'll put you 12 years and it'll be in an oak. That's strong and you're not getting out of the oak. Pardon, master, I will be correspondent to command and do my spiriting gently, spriting gently, do so. And after two days, I will discharge thee. After two days, on the third day, Again, any significance? That's my noble master. A resurrection will come. A new birth will come on the third day after two days labor. What shall I do? Say what? What shall I do? Go make thyself like a nymph of the sea. Be subject to no sight but thine and mine, invisible to every eyeball else. Go take this shape and hither come in it. Go, hence with diligence. Ariel goes out. Now back to Miranda. Awake, dear heart, awake. Thou hast slept well. Awake. The strangeness of your story put heaviness in me. Shake it off. Come on, we'll visit Caliban, my slave, who never yields us kind answer. Tis a villain, sir. I do not love to look on it, but as tis, we cannot miss him. He does make our fire fetch in our wood and serves in offices that profit us. What ho, slave Caliban, thou earth, thou speak. And then within the cell of the cave, there's wood enough within. Come forth, I say, there's other business for thee. Come, thou tortoise. When? Ariel, like a water nymph, and now she appears the way he commanded her. Fine apparition, my quaint Ariel. Hark in thine ear. My lord, it shall be done. Out she goes. And then back to Caliban, thou poisonous slave, got by the devil himself, upon thy wicked dam, come forth. So if we had any doubts about Caliban's progeny, this is not human progeny, at least according to Prospero. Now, if you want to discount all that and say this is superstitious, it's whatever, it's appealing to ideas that Shakespeare could not have hold because of course, Shakespeare could not possibly believe in a spiritual realm, couldn't possibly believe in the Christian truths, then maybe we get into some sort of Western colonialism as if they were a bunch of agnostics, etc. But I don't think that's what the play uh, invites us to consider. <clears throat> Enter Caliban. As wicked do, as e'er my mother brushed with raven's feather from unwholesome fen, drop on you both. So he curses them. First words. A southwest blow on ye and blister you all over. This is not a good relationship. <laughs> Prospero, for this be sure, tonight thou shalt have cramps for cursing us. Side stitches that shall pen thy breath up, urchins shall forth at vast of night, that they may work and all exercise on thee. Thou shalt be pinched as thick as honeycomb, each pinch more stinging than bees that made them. And then Caliban cowers. I must eat my dinner. This island's mine by Sycorax, my mother which thou takest from me. When thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me, would give me water with berries in it and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less that burn by day and night. And then I love thee and show thee all the qualities of the isle, the fresh springs, brine pits, barren place and fertile. Cursed be that I did so. All the charms of Sycorax, toads, beetles, bats, light on you for i am all the subjects that you have which first was mine own king and here you sty me in this hard rock whilst you do keep from me the rest of the island that's the charge prospero's response thou most lying slave whom stripes may move not kindness i have used thee filth as thou art with humane care and lodged thee in mine own cell till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. Ho, 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 wouldst have done so. Thou didst prevent me. I had peopled else this island with Calibans. So, was Prospero unkind to Caliban? They get something of their history. I brought you into my own house. I taught you, I treated you well by your own admission, and for my reward, you sought to rape my daughter. And, and he wished that he had got away with it. This is an unregenerate, per, unre, unregenerate thing, malicious. 
abhorred slave, which any print of goodness thou wilt not take, being incapable of, of all ill, being capable of all ill, rather, I pitied thee, took pains to make thee speak, taught thee each hour one thing or other. When thou didst not, savage, know thine own meaning, but wouldst gabble like a thing most brutish, I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. But thy vile race, shouldst thou, thou, though thou didst learn, had that in it which good natures could not abide to be with. Therefore wast thou deservedly confined unto this rock, thou who hadst deserved more than a prison. You taught me language, and my profit on it is I know how to curse. The red plague rid you for learning me your language. Hag seed, hence. Fetch us in fuel and be quick. Thou art best to answer other business. Shrugs thou, malice? If thou neglect or dost unwittingly what I command, I'll rack thee with old cramps, fill all thy bones with aches, make thee roar, that beast shall tremble at thy dead. No, prithee. And then aside, I must obey. His art is of such power I, it would control my dam's god, Setebus, and make a vassal of him, so slave hence. Let me stop there. But you can see in the early exchanges, this is not, it's not a noble savage. It's not even clear that it's fully human. It is something, it's not, he's also not an animal. What exactly it is, it's unclear because he teaches it to speak. Exercising the dominion mandate, trying to show the beast whatever Caliban is, kindness, but it's not to be read as a colonialist text. I, I, I really think it's an impossible reading of the text based on what we know from the play itself, discounting things like Montaigne's view of cannibals and the fact that it's an, his name is an anagram for it, Caliban, but it's not cannibal, it's Caliban. He's playing with it. Obviously, he knows his audience has some, some idea, but he's not following the cultural text of his age. He's doing his own thing, which is a very Shakespearean thing in consonance with his other plays in this, his last play. And we'll pick it up next time.